Hello, I'm Danny Lifford. I'm glad you joined us for remodeling today. You know, most home improvement programs always are featuring these large-scale renovation projects. Most of them are pretty unrealistic for the average budget. But over the next few weeks here on Remodeling Today, we're going to show you one of the most popular additions that's being built in the United States today. It's a master bathroom, master bedroom edition. Now, we'll start out with talking with our architectural designer who uses a lot of computer equipment and computer-assisted drafting software to provide the design. Now, it makes it a lot easier to change the design as you go along, which is very common in any renovation project. Also, we'll look at the process of laying blocks for the foundation wall, and we'll talk with our job foreman about what's involved in compacting the dirt and providing good bracing for the foundation wall. And as always, we'll have a good home tip segment for you a little later in the show. We've got a full show for you, so stay with us here on Remodeling Today. Welcome back to Remodeling Today. I was taking a look at the permit that we had to secure before we started this project. Now, most every part of the country has different rules and regulations for permitting different additions. You need to make sure you take care of that before you start any project. But before you get that permit, most building officials require a good working set of blueprints. We were very fortunate to have a great architectural designer that worked with us on this project. We visited his office just a few days ago. I'm here with architectural designer David Clarkson to talk about what's involved in designing a project like we're looking at on this week's show. Now, David, what about a master bedroom, bathroom edition? How do you get started with the homeowners on a project like that? Okay, we get together and we sit down and we go over exactly what, to, what they want to do, whether it's an addition or a remodeling type job. Okay, well, now I know over the years, um, you've been in business quite a while, I'm sure the computer has changed a lot about how you do design. Um, tell us about the equipment that you have. Okay. The equipment that we have here is a 17-inch color monitor. Uh, we have a natural keyboard, which is really great as opposed to the flat keyboard. And then also we have the digitizer. The digitizer is a 12 by 12 tablet. It has commands on it. It also has a cursor that you use to pick the commands and it's really made a big difference as opposed to using a mouse. Uh, the other things that we have are the uh, CPU 10 bay uh, hard drive and also a plotter, uh, which has uh, capabilities of plotting out with eight different pen types and also different colors. And prints a pretty good sized piece of paper, too. Sure does. Mm -hmm. Now, what about software? I know the um, term computer-assisted drafting or a CAD system has been around for quite a number of years. What type of software do you use to do this type of remodeling drawing? Mm -hmm. Well, it is a CAD system. It's a system that I've been really familiar with. I've worked on it for about 10 years and it's really made a big difference on the amount of work I can get out and also uh, by the use of libraries within the computer system it helps you to establish uh, a base for drawing plans. I see. Well that does save a lot of time in, in the whole aspect of the drawing process. I'm sure you've saved a lot of time especially when you get down to changes that we'll talk about in a minute but how do you get started as far as the actual drawing of a plan like that? Uh, well first off you start out with the existing floor plan the existing floor plan from there, you go into uh, drawing up the new proposed floor plan from that plan itself. Okay, well, let's see how you've got the existing floor plan here. This is the rear of the existing house. This is the bedroom, the bathroom, the living room, the existing sliding glass doors and step, patio, and fireplace. Uh, the next plan that we're going to see is the proposed plan that I propose for the client. As you can see, what we actually added on was a master bedroom, a walk-in closet, a master bath, a very nice sunroom with plenty of windows and doors, a covered wood deck that's partially covered, and also an exposed portion of the deck with steps going into the rear of the yard. Now that's something that's very popular, having a sunroom adjacent to a master bedroom. Now what about changes, David? I know it's inevitable that changes will take place from the time these drawings are finished and the actual construction takes place. How hard is that to make those changes on a CAD system? Oh, with CAD system, it's really easy. You have the existing double French doors here, Danny, that we were talking about. Now, if I wanted to go ahead and make that change, the only thing I would have to do is go in here and actually erase. Now, we're looking at a blown up picture then, an enlarged picture of the back French door that we're talking about. Right. I'm erasing the existing door that's in place 
and then the only thing I have to do is insert the new proposed uh, door that would go in its place. It's that simple. After these changes have been made, David, how hard is it to convert it from this, transferring it over to paper for blueprints? It's very easy. The only thing I have to do is just zoom it out to all and save this drawing. And then it's just a matter of going through commands and, and plotting out on out. It asks you a bunch of questions, what do you want to do? In this case, I have everything already programmed. And I have to set the scale. And it's all set. Well, I can see where this plotter really saves you a lot of time, David. This only took, what, two or three minutes to draw this entire page. It would have taken a lot longer if you'd have drawn it by hand. And it's great that you can put both the existing and the finished floor plan on one page. It really illustrates to the homeowners what it'll look like. I guess this computer-assisted drafting is something that's going to be around a long time. Yeah, it sure is, Danny. You know, with the change we just made before, I would have had to start all over. And you can see the short period of time it took to make that kind of change. That's great. David, well, I'll let you get back to some more drawing that you have to do on your computer. And you can see that a change in remodeling can be done fairly painlessly if you have a CAD system like this. Now, stay with us here on Remodeling Today. When we come back, we'll take a look at our block masons putting up the foundation wall. Welcome back to Remodeling Today. Well, now that the plans are complete, we can really move along with building the addition. Now, a few days ago, we were able to pour a good concrete footing all the way around the outside of the addition. Now, inside this concrete, which is about 18 inches by 18 inches, we have two continuous steel rods, just like the one you see in front of me here. Now, these are sitting on little wire rod chairs that keeps them right in the middle of the concrete to give it some great support. Also, we turned one up about every four to six feet here that will end up inside the block wall we'll build for the foundation. This will give it some great support. Now, the block men, when they get started on a foundation wall like this, they start by cleaning off the top of the footing, and then they start laying their mortar mix in about a half inch thick for their first course of block. They continue up several courses of block until they reach the top. Now on the top, you may notice a different type of block here, a little cutaway block that's made that way for a very specific reason. Once the clay is compacted in and you're pouring your concrete, this actually acts as a form board to pour your slab up to this level. Now the top of this block represents the floor level of the house and of the addition that will be poured a little bit later. So this works great and allows the concrete to pour down inside the blocks to give it virtually a solid concrete barrier all the way around the foundation. Also the little steel rods inside it um, will be able to be encapsulated with the concrete, giving it a good sturdy, sturdy foundation wall. And you know, many times when we're doing remodeling projects, we have to correct situations that exist in, in the houses that may be inadequate. Attic ventilation is a real problem most of the time. Here we're real lucky that we have a aluminum siding with several ventilated soffit areas that allow good ventilation in the attic. If you have a situation at your house where you don't have adequate intake into your attic, it's something that's easily correctable. In this week's Home Tips segment, Alan will show you how to install different types of soffit vents. On this week's Home Tips, we're talking about life-saving techniques, and I mean saving the life of your roof. Proper ventilation can ensure a longer life of your shingles. Now, ventilation is accomplished by the combination of exhaust and intake. Exhaust happens through power roof ventilators or ridge venting, but it's no good unless you have proper intake. Today, I'll show you about that intake and how you can improve it on your home. Now, we have a mock-up roof here with the soffit. This is the underside, commonly called the soffit, and underneath you'll see a, one type of ventilation. It's called the continuous vent. This is normally installed 
on new homes, and it runs the entire length of the soffit all the way around the perimeter of your house. Great method for proper intake. Next to it is another type of vent. It is just a, a, a rectangular 8 by 16 square, very common. You normally see these about every 8 feet. Great for ventilation. Also on gable roofs, you'll have vents on each gable. Now, unfortunately, a lot of the older homes do not have all of these vents, and I've actually seen some homes with no vents. I'm going to show you a very easy method. These are, these are great to, to, for intake, but they're actually rather difficult to install. This is a very small, this is a two inch vent. Now these are very easy to install, and they also come in other sizes, uh, three inch and three and a half inch. Now what I've got is just an electric drill with a hole saw or a mandrill, two inch mandrill on here. And it's, uh, let me tell you why this is so easy. If you're like me, at all uncoordinated, you don't like to try to nail upside down. We're going to install these, and with this type size, you want to put them in about every three feet or every four feet. Now, you pick a spot right about in the center of your soffit. Also, look for the nails, nail head so that you don't actually are not drilling into one of the, the um, rafters coming down. We're going to start right here and drill right through. <laughs> Now you may notice I took a little time to push that drill around a little bit just to make sure that the installation goes a little easier. And what you want to do is install this just by pushing it up into the soffit. And the neat thing about this, you don't have to use nails to attach it. If you'd like, you can put a little bit of caulking around the edge to help hold it. You can also, before you install it, take a little bit of spray paint, spray it the color of your eave. I do caution you though, if you do want to spray paint it that color, make sure after it's dried a little bit, you take a putty knife or a little razor knife and make sure that the little ridges in the vent are not covered up with paint. Again, you want to install these at least every three or four feet around the entire perimeter of your house and you have got a great ventilation system. And again, I caution you, the reason you want to do this is because this will ensure long life on your roof. Very simple procedure to save you from very costly replacement down the road. Well, that's today's home tips. Don't go away because Danny will be right back with more remodeling today. This week's home tips was brought to you by Senco Fastening System. Welcome back. Well, the block masons are making some great progress in getting our foundation wall up. And here to talk about some of the other progress we're making is George, our job superintendent. Now, George, I know that in starting a project like this a few days ago, one of the first things you had to do is start taking some bricks down. Tell us about that process. Well, Danny, on this type project, the first thing we had to do was remove the bricks from the exterior of the house in the area that we were going to be adjoining to. Um, these are an old type of Chicago brick, and they're solid and fairly easy to clean. Okay. Well, I know that you're really wanting to save as many of those as you can because we're reusing the same type of brick on the outside of the addition. Right. Um, we wanted to save as many bricks as possible without da uh, breaking them, chipping them, and such as. Um, that way, we're able to do our tie-ins when the addition is completed, and we're adjoining our new brick into the older brick. The coloration may vary a little bit sometimes, and we try to save all that we can. Yeah, I notice you have them cleaned and stacked over out of the way there, that by stacking them like that, I guess you also can really find out how many you have and how many more we'll have to get. Um, that's kind of a yellow brick. How are you going to find that? Um, we will have to uh, take some of the bricks out of the stack there and go to the brickyard and kind of try to match them up. Okay, all right. Well, I noticed after you've gotten your bricks down, you've gotten a layer of plastic there. I'm sure that's to keep the possibility of any water, rainwater getting in the house itself. But after you've done that, what's the next step as far as laying out the addition? Um, we started out by squaring up from the house after we took the bricks down and we were able to utilize our frame and square and come straight down the um, end of the house and start squaring up and putting our batter boards up. 
Okay. Tell us about these there. I know that, that you see this on every construction job, and it's really, if these aren't right, nothing will be right. Tell us how you got to this point. Exactly. We just took, um, we got a rough string down the end of the, the house, the existing house, and we were able to line up with the house, and then we just kind of me roughly measured out and determined where to put the stakes in the ground. Mm -hmm. And at that time, we took uh, our builder's level, and since we had removed the bricks, we were able to... Be tear a little bit of the insulation board off the wall and find the actual slab I see. of the house. Well, then we took our, our builder's level and, and found our grade. And then, then we were able to go around to all the stakes that had been braced off and, and basically a permanent thing until the blocks are all up. And we marked our, um, our grade, which is, represents the, the level of the floor So system. the top of the one before then is the same as your floor level in the house? Right. Okay. Right. And I see that your string here to line up for the block man, they're able to, to lay that wall up. And now that the blocks are up, I know they're still a little green as far as not quite being dry. And the cool weather certainly um, makes that uh, process a little bit longer as far as drying. But I know you're fixing to start doing your backfilling. So what about bracing these walls? Well, Danny, any time you have blocks that are over two or three blocks high, you always want to brace these blocks because when you're putting your red clay in and compacting it, it always wants to push out. If you have a good compaction on the clay, it should push out. So what we're, we're just utilizing all these old brick pallets that the blocks were to, delivered on, and uh, we're going to brace them off all the way anywhere we have more than two to three blocks high. Okay, all right. So on some of the lower areas, you're not worried about that? No, not at all. Okay, all right. Now, um, you're just bracing these into the ground, putting stakes into the ground, and uh, once your soil is um, placed around and compacted, then uh, you, you can take all of this down then? Right, right. Uh, we'll be taking it down and the batter boards will be removed and it'll be wide open for the construction process to start. Okay. Well, George, now that you've gotten, um, you know, this bracing going up, I guess the next thing's the dirt. The dirt. Well, tell us about the dirt we're using here, George. What are you using to fill in here? This is basically a sandy type of fill clay, Danny, and it has a real good compaction value. Okay. Now, how are they putting it in here? I notice that they're just spreading it against the outside walls. Oh, uh, we're basically right now just knocking the piles of dirt down and putting it in in um, layers, and we're putting in basically eight to 12 inch layers, uh, or lifts, as they're called. And what we'll have later today is a motorized type of tamp. And we look, we always just um, level the dirt out, put it in in layers, and tamp each layer as we go. Okay, instead of putting it all in at one time and packing down, then you're just putting it in, in, in layers to be able right. to keep the, it compacted. The correct way to, to get a good compaction is to put it in in layers and, and compact it as you come up. That way when your pad is completely leveled out and up to the grade that it needs to be, you'll um, have a good solid foundation. Great, great, okay. Well, I can see they've got plenty of work here to do with, with all of this. Now, you know, Georgia, um, termites are always something in the south that can really be a problem. Um, I know you've had some pretreatments um, by Terminex to really um, avoid that problem. Tell us about that. Right, we had Termini Terminex come out um, when we had our footings dug and prior to our inspection, of course, and uh, they treated the footing, the concrete, under the concrete that the block are sitting on. I see. And they'll be back out um, prior to pouring the slab and they'll, they'll put the treatment in, down in, um, spray all the block areas and all the, the red clay. Good, okay, well that's a good preventative measure. And, and also, I might mention, in the situation where you're building an addition, we'll make sure that your termite bond in your house stays in effect if you get a pretreatment on any new areas like this. Well, George, once you get your dirt up, I know we've got a large, pretty master bathroom going in here. You're gonna have to get the plumber in at some point. Right, Danny, this area all through here is basically a large bathroom uh, with a large garden tub and um, shower and everything. Um, He'll be coming in as soon as we get our dirt up and close to grade, and they'll be roughing in all their drain lines and water lines and um, the things that he needs to do prior to concrete being poured. Okay. Well, I know you got about 80 yards of dirt, uh, 80 cubic yards of dirt that's going in here. That's a lot of work, and we'll let you get back to that. Stay with us here on Remodeling Today. We'll be right back.
Well, now that our blocks are pretty much dried on our foundation wall, we were able to continue spreading our dirt and getting ready to compact it a little bit later in the day. Now, of course, preparing a slab like this is one of the most important aspects of building any addition. Now, join us next week as we show you more about this project as we start our framing and other aspects of the project to get it up to a completed stage. You know, this is one of the most popular additions that's built in the United States with it being a master bedroom and bathroom. We've got some good shows in the weeks ahead, so join us here on Remodeling Today.